there's this quote from Marshall McLuhan, which is anyone who tries to make a distinction between education and entertainment doesn't know the first thing about either. Based on what we knew, we'd probably go down that road again. And that's okay. You're in the right mindset. Welcome to Medic Mindset. I'm Ginger Locke. The Deputy Medical Director of Austin Travis County EMS, Dr. J.R. Pickett, and I sat down and recorded a joint podcast about clinical teaching. His podcast is called the Austin Travis County Office of the Medical Director Official Podcast, and he released a longer version of what you're about to hear. This one is around an hour. His is around two and a half hours. I'll link to it in the show notes at medicmindset.com. I've really enjoyed getting to know Dr. Pickett because every time we sit down, I learn something. And in this episode, you're going to hear my delight as he teaches me new things. The title of this episode is Talking Teaching, but it's not just about teaching because you can't talk about teaching without talking about learning. So whether you're a clinical preceptor or a classroom teacher or a paramedic student, I think there's something here for you. I left the intro in from his podcast because I want you to get a sense of this guy. He is having a blast with his podcast. Check him out. Hey, welcome back, everyone. It is Dr. J.R. Pickett, your host for the Austin Travis County EMS System Office of the Medical Director official podcast. I'm sorry about the sound of my voice. I don't sound like myself. A little bit of a frog in my throat there, which I blame my children for totally. Anyways, I'm getting by. I still have a little bit of a voice, and I really want to get this podcast out. So one of our captains sent me an email, said, it'd be really nice to have a podcast on teaching, you know, clinical teaching at the bedside, which I think is a great idea. I've been doing a lot of clinical teaching over the last uh, you know, couple decades. I'd like to share that, and I want to share some tools and tips. But as it happens, I had recently started listening to a podcast called The Medic Mindset, and this is done by Ginger Locke. She's an associate professor of EMS professions over at Austin Community College, and she interviews a lot of paramedics with a great deal of field experience and knowledge. And I've heard her name a good bit around here. A lot of our medics here in Austin have been taught by her. Uh, She teaches uh, assessment-based management, which to me is just like, that's right where I want to be. That's, That's my wheelhouse. That's where I want our medics to be doing a good assessment, driving their care off of that assessment rather than just running a protocol or something like that. She also teaches trauma, which is also something very close to my heart. I thought that this would be a terrific opportunity for me and her to get together and talk about this because she has got a phenomenal amount of teaching experience. And she has a bachelor's in sociology, which I think has given her the ability to put into words concepts that I've had kind of floating around in my head when I talk about a certain way of doing something when I'm teaching, she's able to name it and and describe it. I really enjoyed this talk with her. You're going to like what you hear. It's like Tango and Cash meets Firefly. It's that awesome and it's that nerdy. So with no further ado, Ginger Lock, J.R. Pickett, talking teaching. My focus areas are twofold. One, I teach trauma which I know is a big uh, topic for you too. Yeah, big time. The other class I teach or I lead, we, we all kind of co-teach many of the classes, but the other class I co-lead is one called assessment-based management. That one is really my baby because it's a putting it together class and we send them through mega codes, really look at their process. We don't care that they necessarily got the right answer, or the perfect dosage or all that. It's really the advanced assessment, differential diagnosis, and then a good care plan. We talk about that concept in process improvement we look at the medic, what they did, regardless of the outcome. We preface the way we test those scenarios by telling them they can correctly treat the patient and still not pass. And that's a little mind-blowing for them. It's possible that they correctly treated them because they just got lucky on the first disease process they considered, and they didn't consider all these other possibilities. Um, So we really are looking at their critical thinking, their judgment, their analysis of data, and how they put it all together. It doesn't matter if you're a naturally good teacher or not. There are people who are and people who aren't. Teaching is a learned skill. It doesn't matter how good you are at it. There's always something else that you can take into it. We want to help provide that education for those uh, trainers in the field. So the students will come out and the the new medics will come out having been precepted in, a, in an organized way, but, but in a productive way, mm-hmm. not just endured the time that they had to do with their FDO. That calls to mind 
the difference between experience and expertise. You can get experience in hours, but without deliberate practice, you're just getting random experiences. And so if you've got a mentor or a coach guiding you through, setting the expectations, this is what we're going to work on, that's where you get expertise. I've always said that uh, practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect. Yeah. People can be like, I've been doing this for years. It doesn't mean you've been doing Mm -hmm. it right. If somebody can help coach and guide somebody and and, and give them those points. And you get all different kinds of learners. You'll get some folks that are sharp when they come in. And and if the the teacher has just a set, kind of this is what I teach and how I teach, you're going to have some of the students that are going to be lost. Some of the students are not going to get that much out of it. And the teacher has to be adaptive to that level. You said, you know, some people are natural teachers, maybe because they've had some experience teaching somewhere along the way, coaching teams, or they have a younger sibling or something where they figured out how to connect with someone. But it is a learned skill. And we're dealing with adults here. So they've gone through a lot of education. They've gone through paramedic school or some type of formal education. And they know how they're motivated. And they can often communicate that to the teacher or the preceptor or the what are we calling them? Training officer, captains, teacher, the teacher has to find out how the learner best learns. But then the learner also needs to ask, how do you teach? If you can preface how you teach, it prepares the learner for what you're about to do. So I'll say, I'm going to keep asking questions until we get to a place where you don't know something or I don't know something. Be prepared for that. We're going to reach that spot where we feel uncomfortable. And I tell them that in advance so they don't feel dumb or something at the end of that long conversation. I think it's the Socratic method where you just keep asking questions. And unless you've prefaced that, a lot of learners aren't used to that because you don't get that in a lot of public schooling. A thing that I think is kind of unique to medical education, we call it pimping, <laughs> uh, of course. And there's there's good pimping and there's bad pimping. The pimping that you endure on rounds and they're asking questions. And a lot of times it's the PIM questions are more oriented for the teacher rather than the learner. So it's the teacher saying, look how smart I am when I ask you these questions that you don't know the answer to. And some of them are read my mind questions. And oh, yeah. the worst part of that is that there are bad teachers that use that to embarrass the learner. They have a misguided notion that this is motivating them. You should read more mm-hmm. and know more and come better prepared when you come in. My take is that you don't know what you don't know until somebody asks you a question that you cannot answer. When we get to that point, we found a gap. Okay, that's given us a jumping off point of something to talk about, not for me to continue asking you questions for you to keep saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, because that's just frustrating and it's non-productive. Okay, medical student, please tell me everything you know about what could happen to a person that would make them sick. That's kind of broad. What are you referring to exactly? I thought you went to medical school. Um, there are infections, injury, autoimmune disease. Yes, I suppose those are all things, but that is not the exact thing I'm thinking of, so I don't think I will give you credit for being correct. That is reasonable. I should study more. This style of learning really helps my self-confidence. I usually start a shift with a resident like this. Tell me what you want to work on. The residents who haven't heard that before, they say, oh, I don't know, all of medicine, like mm-hmm. just be a better doctor. That's not useful. There's way right. too much stuff. Let's focus on something today, leading the team or doing specific procedures. You don't have to work on all of medicine. You can just focus on that area. And then I usually wrap that up at the end of the shift and say, what do you want to work on for next time? Or we've done all of this learning and teaching here. I want you to work on your command presence and mm-hmm. resuscitation next time. And it gives them something to, to read up on. It gives them something to, to look forward to and kind of orients them for our next shift together. What you're describing has been described by a cognitive psychologist. His name is Anders Ericsson, and he wrote a book called Peak. It's about being a peak performer. He threw out this number of you could create an expert by doing something for 10,000 hours it's called the 10,000 hours rule. The popular media picked this stuff up and they were like, oh, this is great. We're going to write really short little articles about this and just do anything for 10,000 hours and you'll be an expert. And that is not what he was saying at all. Malcolm Gladwell took that concept from him and wrote a book called Outliers and it popularized this idea and it's 
it's more nuanced than what was in that book, Outliers. In his book, Peak, which I encourage the listeners to read, he talks about the importance of deliberate practice, what you just described, like let's pick off one or two or three things we're really going to focus on. And then you need to do that in the presence of another expert or a coach who will give you very prompt feedback. So at the end of that rotation or at the end of the call, that's what's fun about EMS is you've got calls and then it didn't go well you get you get a second chance within that same shift to do it over again and then we do it over again so this prompt feedback from a coach is how you create expertise yeah i agree totally that on everything there i love malcolm gladwell's stuff i've read blink Mm -hmm. a couple of times that is a lot of really great knowledge for our setting that getting those unconscious clues and obeying those feelings that you have you look at the patient you're like something is not right here it's not that you're having just a, a hunch. It's not just God whispering in your ears saying, hey, hey, you know, watch out for this patient. They're sick. You know, you're responding to those internal clues that are built through that experience and practice. If you haven't been recognizing those, if they haven't been pointed out at some point along the line, it takes longer to uh, to develop that. We talk about the general impression, like the view from the door of your patient. You could look at that patient and instantly have a sense sick, not sick, or acutely ill, or fairly stable. And we teach them the parts and pieces that we're looking at to make that analysis. There was a trick a nurse taught me, and this was after I finished residency. The patient rolls in and she says, oh, she's, uh, she's got dead person feet. I was like, what? She said, look at her feet. I did. And I was like, yeah, they, they look like cadaver feet. They're pale and sallow. And sure enough, that patient was really sick. And I, I started picking that up even in patients that had normal blood pressures when they walked in, you know, gunshot victims and other you know, blunt trauma victims and septic patients and MIs and that kind of thing. Roll in and look at their feet. Also, a, a good kind of take home point from that is learn everywhere that you can from everyone that you can. There was this concept of the one minute preceptor. I hadn't heard it put in this in this structure format before, particularly designed for clinical teaching. I get a lot of students and a lot of interns that are kind of in this data collection mode. They go and they see the patient and they interview the patient, they examine the patient, they have all of this data. I say, okay, what do you want to do? They're like, um, uh, I, I don't know what I want to do here. Step one is get a commitment from them. I want you to come to me with a plan. You don't have to know what's going on with the patient exactly at that time. Force that commitment on the part of the learner. Then probe them for supporting evidence. Why do you think this? Why do you want to get that test? Once you probe for that supporting evidence, you can teach some general rules. For example, that 27-year-old chest pain patient, sure, it is probably not myocardial ischemia, but they wouldn't be the first 27-year-old to have a heart attack. So it'd probably be a good idea to get a, an EKG. And then lastly is provide some, uh, some additional correction. Hey, this, uh, this kid is under the age of 12, so maybe we would, don't want to go with Fennigan. Maybe we want to go with Zofran uh, in this uh, child instead. Or any kid with vomiting, you need a blood sugar because that's how type 1 diabetics present for the first time. It takes more than one minute. Fortunately, in EMS, we're dealing with one patient at a time. Typically, we have the time to do that. Get a commitment probe for substantiating evidence and find out, okay, why do you want to go down this road? Teach those general rules, reinforce the things that they did right, and then correct whatever it is that they're doing wrong. One of the things you're asking the preceptor to do is ask the learner, why did you do something? The word why sometimes knocks people back on their heels. And so if you can ask in a way that says, you know, what did you see to get you to that conclusion. Strangely, that change in wording will keep the learner open. Sometimes I'll tell the student, we're going to do a a thought experiment because these new medics, they want to please their preceptors. There's a lot going on in their head (laughs) besides just exploring (laughs) ideas. They're really wanting to, to look shiny and good. The more you can do to take any type of judgment or value statements, like why, helps keep them open. I love this idea of reinforcing what they did right. And it's not because their egos are fragile. It's not because we're trying to validate people. It's not this everybody gets a medal mentality. The idea there is that sometimes people do things right by accident. And so when you can recap the things they did right and tell them why it is right in the context of the patient, 
you're just reinforcing concepts that they may actually be missing. It's just as valuable as negative feedback to tell people why they did things right. Along those lines, it's really important to praise the process and not praise the the person. Let's say the first, you know, two or three calls go really well. Do not tell them they are a natural at it. Do not tell them, <laughs> okay, you've got this this dialed. That's dangerous because suddenly now they're up on a pedestal and they have nowhere to go but to fall. And in their heart, they may think, oh, I just got lucky with that one. If you can praise the process and saying, I can tell you've spent a lot of time in the lab or you have worked very hard on EKGs, that will keep them from psyching themselves out down the line. It's funny. I read an article on uh, teaching children. I'm a father. I've got an eight-year-old and four-year-old daughters. This article said that when you're praising children, when they do a good job, you praise the hard work that they put in. And that article you read, I have no doubt, came from the work of the phenomenal woman psychologist, Carol Dweck, who wrote a book called Mindset. Many of the listeners will be familiar with it because it's been really popularized. She did a TED Talk, the book she wrote in 2006. So these concepts have been floating around a long time. And the concept is the difference between growth mindset and a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset assumes, it presumes that intellect is, is fixed and that you're either smart or you're not, and there's nothing you can do about it. And then a growth mindset is just that hard work leads to, to success and focused work can increase your abilities. There's a very simple way to switch somebody from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, or it's a, it's a simple tool. It probably isn't this simple. If you can just say the word yet at the end of their negative statement. So if they say, I'm not good at IVs, if you will just say as the preceptor, if you'll say to them yet, right, it will remind them we've got work ahead of us, but anybody can be good at an IV if we just put in the time. Uh, and you can do that with, with every negative statement, just tack on the yet at the end, and then slowly they will s- hopefully <laughs> start developing this growth mindset. I like it. One thing that I see preceptors want to sometimes mold the learner into themselves and their own style. I try to recognize the fact that that learner that comes to you is the product of several experienced clinicians and teachers, no matter how they come to you, unless they like popped out of the womb into your arms to learn to be a paramedic, then somebody else has taught them something before uh, before now you have to allow for style allow for differences in practice it, it's a practice of medicine for a reason those learners are still trying to they're still trying to assimilate that figure out what is their style going to be i'll let them uh, i'll let them go like they won't necessarily do things exactly the way that i would have done it but if they're not hurting a patient or in danger of hurting a patient then i'll let it go and then later on we can talk about it if you correct every little style point that they're doing, then the learner gets into this mode where, like you said, they want to please their preceptor. They they want to be seen as, as good. And, and uh, so then they just try to anticipate what the preceptor wants and do things that way rather than developing their own style. If you give feedback about everything, it gets lost. So if you can, at the end of a call, think of the three most important things that the, you want the learner to take away, then it doesn't get diluted. So just save the rest. The, the learner can only take in so much. <laughs> you don't want to overwhelm them. Uh, true. What I like to do is is tell them, especially uh, EMS is very good with this because you're dealing with one patient at a time. So uh, at the end of each one, give me a couple of takeaways that you got from this patient encounter. Or, all right, we just saw this patient. I want you to read up on this. Right. And you can use five-minute clinical consult or e-medicine or paramedic textbook or something like that. But you've seen a patient that had this condition or that. Uh, now I want you to reinforce that by reading up and, and getting all those uh, those little points in. It's not as easy in the EMS environment to say, all right, we've got a patient with a chief complaint of back pain. Uh, so I want you to read up on this really quick before you see the patient. It's easier to do that in a hospital environment than it is in the field. But certainly afterwards, get those take-homes and, and, and maybe be able to pick up some of those, those smaller points. When we're, we're talking about reading textbooks or reading five-minute clinical consult in these kinds of books, how we learn from textbooks. <laughs> There's a book called Make It Stick, and the author is Peter Brown, but he's not actually the, the psychologist behind the book. 
he's just a really good author. And he integrated all their information into a, a really readable book called Make It Stick. He differentiates fluency from mastery. So you can read something over and over and over. And as you're reading it, you get this false sense. It's an illusion of fluency because you're like, yep, this is familiar. I've read this paragraph three or four times. Got it. The way to have mastery is through effortful, active retrieval. You read it, you close it, and then you try to articulate it to someone else. And that's that's a hard thing to do. That active retrieval helps put it into long-term memory. So if you're studying COGS, if you're studying anything out of a textbook, reading it and rereading it and highlighting it won't work. That doesn't work. Or it may work. It just takes probably 10 times the amount of time. The way to, to efficiently learn info is uh, read it, close the book, quiz yourself about it. And then probably the most efficient way is to try to articulate that information to someone else. And then you realize very quickly where your holes are. In medicine, you hear this, see one, do one, teach one. We're often, we're very, we're trying to get to this place where we're teaching others. Because once you can teach it or explain it to someone else, you've got it, you've mastered it. Other things that are discussed in Make It Stick is the idea of interleaving information. And this is perfect for EMS. So interleaving just means Rather than studying EKGs for three hours straight, it is much more a, a better use of your time to study for EKGs for 20 minutes, study something different, study EKGs, come back to them, and this going back and forth, again, it gets back to this retrieval I, idea, and I, the neuroscience is interesting, but probably not interesting enough for a podcast <laughs> um, about uh, the pathways in the brain, but retrieving information from short-term memory basically is how we create long-term memory. And then spacing it out, this idea of cramming. Most adults have figured this out by now. Cramming doesn't work so well. Um, you have to to really take off little chunks at a time and space them over time and reflect on what you've learned and all of that. That's why I'm an advocate for paramedic programs that are that are longer, right? You've got two years to integrate this knowledge, sleep on it, play with it versus really quick, 8 o'clock in the morning till 5 at night, it's a tougher way to integrate knowledge. So when you're teaching this, the student, we tend to pimp them on what's called explicit knowledge. And yeah. this is knowledge of procedures. This is facts. These are verifiable things that you can, you can ask a question, you know, how many pulmonary veins are there? Or what is the dose for um, ketamine for a dissociative dose, IV weight-based, something like that, that they can just recall and uh, straight up recall. And that is technician level stuff. The clinician has this much broader tacit knowledge. This comes through uh, mental models, you know, mentally walking through a procedure and, and mentally walking through a scenario. You know, what happens if this happens, then I will do this. Certainly pattern recognition, which Malcolm Gladwell talked about in Blink and the unconscious pattern recognition that we have. There's uh, the, the perceptual discrimination, seeing the subtle difference in ST elevation between the MI and the early repolarization or left ventricular hypertrophy. Judging typicality, which is knowing what's normal. If you know what's normal, then you know what's abnormal and then that kind of points you off in, in that direction. I want to jump in right there. Yeah. I had this student that came from the military. One day we were doing backboarding. This is back when we valued backboards. Eh, I don't know. We probably didn't even value it, but we were doing it. <laughs> I hate backboards so much. <laughs> backboards cause cancer. That is my take. Anyway, it, the skill isn't important. What happened that day was really neat. The student said, and this is a combat medic, right? And he said, he looked at another student's final kind of work. And he said, I know what right looks like, and that's not it. And I was like, <laughs> okay, there's a lot of arrogance in that, but that's really interesting. Now let's break down exactly what are you looking at that's not right? Because sometimes people can get so, get this tacit knowledge that they cannot articulate to other people. And it really takes time to be like, okay, what exactly are you seeing that isn't right? And it's probably, you know, 10 different things he or she could adjust a little bit. Also, looking at a patient saying, you know, the patient will look right, mm -hmm. um, and uh, knowing that. And then lastly, the uh, mindsets. Uh, and you talked about that, that growth mindset of the uh, clinician, the mindset of the data collector versus the 
clinician, the, the provider that's caring for the patient that's making those decisions. You can kind of set that early on. I want you to be in the mindset that you're leading this resuscitation. I'm going to stand over here mm -hmm. and I'll step in when I need to. And I'll provide a little guidance uh, when necessary and we'll get where we need to be. But I want you to be at the head of the bed and I want you to be determining the course of action, giving the orders. It's important for that leader to offer up an idea, whether it's right or wrong. The process of offering up the idea is what we're looking for. It takes, I think, a lot of confidence on the learner's part. You don't want somebody who doesn't give a shit if they're wrong, right? You mm -hmm. want somebody that cares about what they do at the same time is is strong enough to be vulnerable. Right. And you as the teacher are responsible for creating that environment in which it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to ask questions. Then you can provide some guidance and correction and help. I had a question for you about bedside teaching. In general, what are your thoughts about talking about a case in front of the patient, talking about the findings? Is that something you've done um, when you're teaching people? Is that something you think preceptors should be doing? I absolutely do, with rare exception, right? If you're about to tell somebody that they've got cancer, then that is a, a structured conversation that you need to have with somebody. If you are telling a family member that their loved one is dead or is going to die. That's a structured conversation that you have to have. And so I don't tend to do it that way. I, I tend to kind of discuss it with the learner and then, and then model it. And then uh, they, they know it and then can do it next time. I find that patients are reassured when you've got a learner and everybody knows this, we've got medical students, we've got residents, we've got paramedic students, we've got nursing students and all these students in these environments that they are going to be cared for by them. When you are talking with the learner in front of the patient, especially doing so in a way that's not insulting, that's not degrading, that, that's not embarrassing, teaching and guiding them, then the patient's reassured that one, they're getting close observation and deliberate teaching on the part of the preceptor, this also is a good opportunity for the preceptor to demonstrate their knowledge. Not to, not to the learner. The learner already knows you know what you're doing. To the patient. The, so they're like, oh, okay. Somebody who knows what they're doing well enough to teach this other person what they're doing is here and is watching over me. At some point, we got away from bedside teaching. And so when I start doing it, sometimes students are like, you're talking about the patient in front of them? Like, absolutely. I see this also in the back of an ambulance on the way to the hospital. The medics won't talk to each other, the student and the teacher, about the patient. And I think it's a great time. I think it's a missed opportunity. And if you will tell the learner that that's something that you're going to be doing, some bedside teaching. And then I also ask the patient, I tell them, we're going to talk about you, uh, around you. Is that okay? I want to get back to bedside teaching. I think a lot of it, a lot comes out of it. Because, it, again, it's getting back to that prompt feedback, too. Okay, how are we going to look for JVD in this patient? We'll go through the mechanics. Do it together right there, rather than saying at the end of the call, did you look at JVD? Well, no, kind of forgot, right? You've got to do it. Sometimes you have to do it right there with the patient. That's our chance. It helps the patient, too, because one of the things that patients complain about a lot about their interaction with healthcare providers is they didn't explain to me what was going on. They don't understand how we arrived at a diagnosis what we saw that concerned us. As I'm teaching the learner, I'm also teaching the patient as we do that. Like you, I, I warned them, we're going to talk a little bit of shop about what, what we've got here. As the learner and I are talking about, well, you see this, uh, this ST elevation, but you notice that there's a pretty distinct J point and then a pretty distinct takeoff of the T wave here. So there's most likely early repolarization. And then the patient probably understood none of that. But then I turn to the patient and say, what we're talking about is these little waves here, the way that they appear show that your EKG is benign and is not showing right now that you're having a heart attack. I think they like to come on that journey a lot of the time with us because then they get a little bit more understanding of what's going on with them. I wanted to have a little plug in there about bedside teaching because there's such a chance right there, a case study, being with a patient, getting these patients, as you said earlier, one at a time. If we use those opportunities well, you've got a fully engaged learner. The bedside teaching, you can also challenge the learner to talk to the patient about their findings. JVD is another good example. We've looked for JVD in a patient and we'll say, no, no, I don't see any JVD. And the patient will say, is that good? That's the chance for you to 
have the learner explain to the patient their findings and what those findings mean. If they can explain it in layman's terms, you know they've got it. That brings me to the quote that Einstein said, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't fully understand it yourself. And that's that playing around with information. Once you can teach it to others, you've got it. You've mastered it. Well, the origin of the word doctor is the word dottori, which means to teach. Uh, because huh. to teach our patients uh, about their disease, that's a core part of being a medical provider is helping and teaching the, the patient. It goes to the respect for autonomy, which is one of the core principles of medical ethics, helping the patient make informed decisions about their health care. When you're talking about bedside teaching and, and the patient has been seen by the learner and the learner is presenting their findings and their and their plan and so forth, it's very easy for a preceptor to interrupt. My take is shut up and let them talk. Let the learner talk. Let them give their findings, their plan. They'll get to where they need to be eventually. And we're just so impatient. We're like, okay, we've got places to be. We've got other people to see. Let them talk. Let them get to their conclusion because they probably have the right idea about what to do for the patient and where to go. And if they don't, then you have this opportunity to to start guiding them. And there was a preceptor that I had in uh, residency, ER doctor by the name of Jim Hazenga. He was great at this. I presented a patient to him once. I said, this is what I'm thinking. So this is where I want to go. And he just started asking me questions. They were the right questions. What did you think about this? And did you consider this? I realized that he got me to where he wanted me to go, which was 180 degrees from where I was going at that time. And he did it completely without telling me what to do. You ask the right questions, you'll get the learner to where you want them to be. They'll get there on their own, which is even better. So they're not just regurgitating what you told them. They're actually seeing the thought process that, that went into that conclusion that you've drawn as the, the expert or clinician or the, uh, the master clinician or whatever you want to call it. And that's so hard to do. It's so much easier to give a lecture and say what you know and hope that the learner caught it somewhere along the way. But we know for sure that dialogue and stories and interacting with another human, that's when we learn and that's how we, we retain those things. There's an art to that. I certainly couldn't do that at the beginning of guiding somebody in their thinking to the right answer because I had to remember, okay, what do they know? And then let's build on that. Let's start with maybe very basic pathophys, and then let's talk about the body system, and then the organ within that, and then what, what diseases can affect that organ, and the layering of that information. Starting, Start with what they do know, and then keep building off of that. At the end of that call, I always want to say, how do you think that went? I try to do that in a setting where we don't have a lot of distraction. Uh, I'll do it on a big call. I'll also do it end of shift. The first thing I say is, well, how do you think that went? You're asking that learner for some genuine self-assessment have they already recognized areas where they can improve so then i'm not like harping on stuff that they already know this also gives you a chance to connect with the discouraged learner maybe you had a resuscitation that was a total cluster uh, or just a, a shit show if the learner is like oh i just totally screwed that up a hundred percent i'm quitting residency right now and I'm going to go work for an insurance company or something like that. Like, I will say, tell me what you think you did right. Before we talk about what they did wrong, tell me what you think went right in this. And so it refocuses them on pulling good lessons. I think that my rapport with the patient was very good. Uh, I think I explained procedures to the patient well and included them in decision-making. Something like that, uh, that gets them thinking, okay, I did some things right. Now we can talk about the things that you could do better for next time. They're not climbing back in that dark hole where their mind was after this resuscitation that just went completely wrong. Our medical director does this with our students. He comes and does scenarios with them. That's the first question he asks is, how did it go? And he wants to hear the good stuff first. The faculty go, and we also watch them work through this. And we'll give a little feedback, but really it's the medical director's show. So I've gotten to watch that dialogue and the students will be trying to say the good stuff and they'll just start saying the bad stuff. And he has to keep interrupting them and say, nope, we're only talking about good stuff right now. And there's a lot of valuable information that comes out of that also. On a call, 
there are like, I would imagine 1,000 decisions or steps to calls. And so there is surely we can find something that was done well, but usually the stuff that's done well, we kind of don't think about it. I've even given a student feedback once where I said, you stood really close to the patient the whole call. That was really good because that's all <laughs> That's all I had. Fantastic. <laughs> there are a million things that they could do wrong. And I know it's laughable, but they could have done that wrong too. We forget the stuff they're doing right because it looks right and our brain just registers right and there's nothing to comment on. And you want to bring them back to specific things, you know, specific tangible things. So the, the learner that says, oh, I suck at this. So like, oh, I just, I totally jacked that up. All right, how'd you jack it up? Just everywhere, I just totally jacked it up. Let's get down to specific things because those are manageable. Those are things that we can avoid uh, in the future. As you bring it down to to tangible points, it's not this big, scary, like I'm a terrible provider. It's specific lessons learned from this event. Yeah, that's perfect. I always ask them, with the information that you had at the time, and things went bad, the information that you had at the time, not with retrospect, what would you do differently? They may come to the conclusion, based on what we knew, we'd probably go down that road again. And that's okay. You're in the right mindset. That's perfect. I'm going to add that into my practice because I don't say that. I have been saying, what would you do differently? You're absolutely right that we have to say with the information that you had, because it's completely unfair in retrospect to do something differently. That's not even a thing. Now we're just talking about theoretics. You're just talking about hypotheticals. I love that. We are often working on limited information. In EMS, what we have is fairly limited. We have a few diagnostic tools available to us. We've certainly got our eyes and our ears and our hands, but we have to go down a path based on that limited information, go down a differential diagnosis road with that, and sometimes we're going to be wrong. The key thing is, were there any clues that occurred that would have led you down a different path? Right. That would have taken you this way and, and, and might have been right at the time. Clues or things that you should have gone looking for that you forgot to go look for. Yeah. One thing I wanted to mention, I want to get it out before we conclude the podcast, is about uh, mental rehearsal. Especially if you're on a slow truck and you're not running call after call, you've got all this downtime and it's an opportunity. You've got a novice sitting with an expert and it is the perfect opportunity for learning. It's one-on-one -on -one instruction, which as an educator, I just would love to have that all day, every day. I have students that come back and say, we ran through scenarios, like tabletops, and that's great. Keep doing that. And the more you can rehearse these calls and say, okay, you know, this is the standard STEMI call. Now let's throw this little kink in it. How are you going to manage that? Oh, here's a different kink. How are you going to manage that? And you start creating these kind of scripts and plans. And the best simulator we have is in our brain. If you can um, just visualize and fully put yourself there. And there is a lot of research about mental rehearsal. Popularly, we know about it because we see the greats like Michael Phelps use imagery and visualization. Um, it's been written on and in popular kind of newspaper articles about his process. There's a lot to be learned from elite athletes about their imagery and how they do it. And just a, a brief synopsis of their process. A few key things that you should do as you're trying to visualize going through things. It's, it's really great for psychomotor skills. Starting an IV is just a great example. The guidelines for visualizing starting an IV are, one, you have to already be somewhat good at it. You have to already know the discrete steps. You have to have a, a task analysis and have worked through it some in real life. Then you can sit down with your mind simulator, go through the steps with your eyes closed, the recommendation is to do it from the first person. So you wouldn't be watching yourself from another part of the room. You need to be looking through your own eyes, seeing your own hands, seeing the patient's arm. The more you can bring in all the senses, the better. So if you could imagine the smell of the tape when you open up the tape or the smell of something or the feeling of their skin or the sounds in the room, even better. So the more high fidelity you can keep your simulation, the better. And then you just go through it. And it, it's okay to go through it slowly, not real time. You go through each little individual discrete step. And this is exactly what Michael Phelps does before his, his swims. He will visualize the whole swim stroke by stroke by stroke. And he has done that millions of times in his own mind. Here's the coolest part is he has done something that we can also do. And that is he will visualize something going wrong. So his goggles fog up and he will swim that whole swim in his mind, 
with fogged up goggles. So we can do the same. Now imagine the patient's a little restless. Okay, so they're moving, they're squirming a little bit. How am I going to start that IV on that patient? There's this uh, gentleman named Michael Loria, and I've learned so much from him. He's an elite special forces guy who is now in med school and bringing a lot of this information from military tactical training to the medical field. And it's surprising that we haven't already done this. You know, we know how people get good at psychomotor skills. We know because the NFL is paying for a tremendous amount of like sports psychologists <laughs> and all these people <laughs> to come in and coach them. We can learn a lot from them. So um, it's called mental rehearsal or visualization. The other kicker is something called dynamic imagery where you actually move your body just a little bit as you're doing the skill. So on it, fMRI scans, they've taken people who are actually starting an IV, maybe not the IV, but they've taken people who are actually doing a skill. And then they've looked at people who are imagining doing the skill with a little bit of subtle kind of movement of their body. And the scans are almost identical of the amount of (laughs) brain activation. You know, whenever we've got a procedure that we're going to do that is uh, maybe a low frequency procedure, I strongly support using YouTube as a as a teaching model. Like, we're just about to do a procedure. Okay, go to Robertson Hedges and just read through it. So you kind of refresh your memory on the various steps and doing that, that mental rehearsal with it. Well, now we've got YouTube, which is even better for that, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you get the right source, right? You know, probably wouldn't want college humor teaching me how to do a surgical cricothyroidotomy, but it, there's a lot of good <laughs> stuff out there. Yeah. When preparing to do a procedure, usually in the year, I've got a little bit of time. In EMS, we often don't have that luxury. Yeah. But after the call, say, I want you to to just read up on this procedure or watch the video just to kind of reinforce uh, a lot of those points that you've got. Man, I love YouTube. There's a surgical crank video on YouTube that I wish had existed before I was in the field. I went into the field not knowing what it looks like. I didn't even have a visual. I knew what it looked like on the mannequin. But to see that first, well, on, on YouTube, like to see a video kind of fills in a lot of blanks that are just, they're just blank until you've seen something. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) They're just blank until you, and you don't know that those are blind spots Yeah. until you're in it and you're like, Oh man, that's uh, (laughs) yeah, there's a problem. Yeah. You would talk about some of our teachers that we've had that, that have influenced us in a positive way. When I was an intern, I was on trauma rotation, second month of internship. This is a busy level one trauma center. We see 3,600 trauma patients a year. This professor there, Mary McCarthy, she's head of surgery, uh, head of trauma at the time. I think this is like my first week in trauma. We get a patient in who is just jacked up from the feet up. This is a blunt trauma. And uh, this guy was sick and he's going to the operating room. We're having to do a bunch of resuscitation stuff in the bay. And it fell to me to do the chest tube which absolutely like eager and like ready to do like, yes, I am going to do this. In the meantime, I've done a couple of chest tubes in simulation. I've done a couple on live patients, but they were elective and slow and methodical. And I got to read up on the procedure beforehand. That was not this guy. This guy was one that needed time now. Uh, I got the scalpel. I've got him prepped. I've got, got everything there. I've kind of briefly like gone through the procedure in my mind and I'm heading into cut. I was probably shaking a little bit and I'm doing this in front of the head of surgery, right? And she helped me through like with little points and she didn't stand there over my shoulder the whole time saying, now do this, now do that, now, now do that. She just would give me a little pointer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just extend that incision a little bit more. This trauma bay looked like roadhouse. Uh, like there's blood running in it, all this stuff. And she's still managing the rest of this resuscitation, giving orders to the nurses and asking questions of them and, the, and of the, um, the residents. And I had such respect for how she was able to teach me in a very constructive way in the middle of that environment, which a lot of less experienced teachers or, or clinicians would kind of fall into just giving orders, just barking orders, like do this, do this, do this. Uh, but that interaction right there really set my opinion of her uh, in a very, very good way. Yeah. I hope as people are listening to that story, they're imagining, am I that guy? You know, am, am I that kind of preceptor? I, I sure am listening from that perspective and if you're not there yet, it's okay. It just means that you have more work to do. You're probably getting more comfortable with your own practice to get to that place where you can teach someone else. So we take students two at a time to the ER. IVs are come up a lot. They often forget to pop the constricting band. The other student will tell them, hey, pop the constricting band. I'm like, 
hang on. Like, <laughs> I was going to give them 20 more seconds because usually in the next 20 seconds is when it occurs to them to pop it. You start figuring out as the preceptor how much time to allow someone to keep like the mistakes happening. Now is when they normally have figured it out. If they're not going to, they will by now. Just like it takes repetition with patients, it takes repetitions with learners to figure out, oh, this is the normal path of a novice. There was a story that a good friend of mine told me, and he and I were classmates. He's doing a central line. The attending is standing there looking at him. And my friend, he's a, a very, um, you know, a very solid, confident guy. There's really nothing that phases him. He's doing the central line, doing through all the procedures. And the, uh, the attending is standing there like, you know, okay, what are you doing now? All right, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Like every single step of the way. And finally, my friend, I'm not naming names here. He takes the four by fours, puts it down over the site, looks the attending dead in the eye and says, every time you ask me a question, it adds 10 seconds to this procedure. <laughs> and the attending's <laughs> eyes got huge. And he, he told me, he said, I realized at that point that there was a line and I had just crossed it. I love that. We, we got to har- not harass the learners. And we're mm-hmm. always, especially if, if we don't think that they're particularly experienced in this and we want to make sure that like they're doing every step right. You got to step back as the preceptor for a moment. Again, you don't want to let them hurt the patient, but let them work through the procedure on their own. You have to let them work through the mindset on their own. And that is whether you're doing a step-by-step procedure like that or running a resuscitation and you're running a whole team. Right. You're making me think of something that happens with the really, really beginner, and that is something called auditory exclusion. That means when they're under stress, and it doesn't take much for them to be under stress, they can't hear as well. Just know that they're probably not hearing you anyways. If they're, let's say, intubating, okay, and you're over their shoulder, and it's their first tube ever, trust me, they aren't hearing a word you're saying. (laughs) And that can actually be a little dangerous. And so I talk to students about that, and I will tell them, if we get to that point where I realize you're not hearing me, I am going to touch you a little bit and say say the word reset. It's almost like a safety word. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's when I realize like things are so far gone um, that they're they have fixation error, they have tunnel vision, they're not hearing anything, they're stuck. Watch new learners for that too. I think that we can sometimes hamper them in that too. Like I've seen it where somebody's intubating somebody and we know it's a difficult airway. And so we've prepared for that and, and they're going intubating. Somebody, and there's somebody that's always standing there shouting out the pulse ox, like every few seconds, 98, 97, 97. Yeah. With intubating, I would recommend that you don't talk at all. You only get them talking, go in with a plan where they're going to say what they see. If you're doing direct laryngoscopy that, you know, they can start describing what they're seeing because you can't get in there and do it for them. You really have no help talking no. in their ear. I mean, what are we doing? <laughs> you know? Or you're standing over their shoulder and you've got the glide scope. So you're, you're looking at the screen saying, okay, to the left, to the left. They know they need to go to the left. Okay. <laughs> they're manipulating the patient. They, they got it. They, they, this they, gets back to your, they understand um, it. shut up and let them talk. You know, it's like, yeah. So we can't control the patients that we get. We can't control who calls 911 in our district at a particular time. It could be that you have a patient that is the just not a lot of learning value. Like, okay, it's a little lady with chest pain and normal vital signs and a negative EKG. And so I'm going to give aspirin and we'll give nitroglycerin and we're going to take them to the hospital. Then say, okay, how do you think that went? I think it went fine. Like the other 10 that we've done in the last couple of shifts. Then I like to play the what if game. So what if this patient had some stroke-like symptoms in addition? Where would that cause you to go? Say that you took their pulses and they had a really strong left radial pulse, but a really weak right radial pulse. What would, might that clue you in on? You can make a boring call into an interesting one just by playing that what-if game. And it comes back to that mental rehearsal that you were talking about. It's perfect. And it's a perfect thing to do if you have any downtime. I think that's great. So I want to talk a little bit about nonverbal communication with the learner in the resuscitation bay, especially, or on the scene. You've got a lot of providers there. Oftentimes, particularly EMS, you end up with several ALS providers on the scene. You've got a lot of people that all know what to do, but aren't necessarily a team. They all know what has to happen with this patient. Then things can get kind of kind of chaotic, and then 
the learner that is still trying to build their own practice patterns that is still working on their command presence and so forth can sometimes get overwhelmed by that. And then if you as a preceptor, are, you know, riding their ass, then that just makes things uh, worse for them. What I teach is stand at the end of the bed. Who stands at the end of the bed? If I'm running a resuscitation, I'm standing at the end of the bed. Right. If it's the resident, like mm-hmm. if they don't have to do a procedure right then, they stand at the end of the bed and I stand in the corner. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, like I say, sh- shut up and let them talk. But let them be there and kind of take everything in. Like you were saying with you, you do the reset thing, you kind of gently touch them. I'll touch them and then kind of whisper something in their ear. Hey, is anybody working on this? Oh, yeah. Kelly, can you go ahead and start drawing up uh, succinylcholine for this patient and get those drugs? Because I don't want to interrupt their thought process. The other thing that that does is I'm not shouting at them from the other end of the room. It's that low voice because then it kind of brings their voice down and then that brings everybody's voices down. I speak softly in resuscitation and I speak to individuals, you know, touch gently on the shoulder. Hey, can you go ahead and get the Foley catheter? Could you go ahead and draw up 50 of ketamine? Doing that and, and bringing that noise down, it brings a lot of that chaos down in, in there as well. And I learned that from a police officer. Bring your voice down. You don't lose your presence. You'll still be in the middle of everything. As you bring that down, then everybody else comes down as well, and it, and it gets to be a bit more organized. So another thing I see happen a lot of times in, in the hospital. You know, I have a question. Yes, you- so you stand, okay, high acuity call, the person running the code or um, running the resuscitations at the feet. You stand behind them. Where are you? I stand behind and off into the corner. So mm-hmm. they don't see me. So they own that scene. I like it. If they're involved in the airway and they're doing the airway decision making, I stand at the end of the bed rather than standing behind them and, you know, like lurking. A lot of that's my way of showing trust in them. I'll tell them I'm not putting gloves on mm-hmm. um, because I do not expect that I'll step in. Uh, yeah. to, uh, to this procedure in working those uh, resuscitations and those scenes a lot of times you're working with other people you've worked with for many years having worked in the same place for 12 years uh, i have a good relationship with my colleagues my nurses and technicians all, you know, all the various allied health folks i trust them and they trust me they may not yet have developed that with the resident that just started rotating there they'll come to me with questions and ask for decisions and I always redirect them. I remember as a resident, it used to piss me off that the nurse would go to the attending and the attending would like totally change my plan. And I wouldn't hear about this until later. I redirect them to oh, um, ask Dr. Abraham or I will relay that to them kind of in a public way. If the nurse says, hey, do you want to give any antibiotic? Oh, good question. Dr. Abraham, would you like to give this patient any antibiotic? Establishing who is in charge of that resuscitation. Yeah, and I'm thinking of the awake patient. I don't want to derail your thought process too much, but we go in and do assessments on very stable, awake patients, me and the learner. The student will ask the question, the assessment question. The patient will start telling me the answer. And it's because they can pick up on some type of subtle um, clue that I'm... There's a vibe. Yeah, they get it. And so I've learned with those patients to actually stand behind the patient because they will just keep making eye contact with me. They want to talk to me. <laughs> and I want them to talk to the student. And so it's it's hard to describe on a podcast, but when I have been in the, the view of the patient, and the patient looks at me and starts talking to me, I'll just look over to the, the student as the patient's talking, and the slowly I'll watch the patient then start talking to them and switch their emphasis onto the student. So either hide from your patient if they're they're talking to you as the preceptor, or give them the nonverbal clue like, hey, he or she's in charge. Talk to that guy. <laughs> Hide from the patient. I, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. We talked about setting expectations, particularly when going to a call. I would tell the, the learner, okay, you are running this call. Set that mindset early on so they go into it, even if we know it's going to be a, a disaster. You know, It's a bus full of hemophiliacs cla- crash into a glass factory or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think that's great once they've put some things together. Early, we talked about how we encourage them to focus on one thing at a time. So you may be thinking of cadets who are already medics practicing and that you want them to go run calls. But for the student, they've got to learn how to put on an EKG, how to interpret the EKG. There are all these little parts and pieces. If you were to tell them run the whole call, 
that may be a little daunting, although they do get there before they graduate. Oh, sure. I, yeah, you wouldn't do that to a novice learner. That mm-hmm. would be setting them up for failure and, right. and would probably set them backwards in their progression. And that comes to diagnosing a learner, figuring out what level they're on. Diagnosing uh, and, a learner. I like that. Uh, and just figure out where they where they are mentally you know, mm-hmm. beforehand. You might have that experienced clinician or that rock star student that's ready for that. I think there's another myth that some folks have that it's easier to sit back and teach and it's not. Being a teacher is it's more work than being the student. It's harder than being the student, especially because you know their uh, their success is so dependent upon your ability to connect with them and convey the information and find their weaknesses and work on those and bring them up and, and develop a whole working plan for them. Hats off to the preceptors that are doing it in the field. I can do it with mannequins, and it's the mannequin's not listening or sick. They've got two audiences. They've got a they're trying to take care of a patient, and they're also trying to take care of a learner. That's a big task. I think this is probably something that belonged at the beginning of the conversation, but probably the most important piece of it all is trust between those two people. Setting that up early on, where the same team here, we are on the same team. Critique's going to come, but it's all with the same goal in mind. I know our students think they're performing for the preceptor, and that's not what's going on. They are (laughs) (laughs) performing for the patient, and then the preceptor is going to evaluate that performance and grow something together. Having those early conversations between preceptors and students about their shared goal, that's going to be key. I probably could talk to you for another two hours, but I know we both have stuff we got to get to. True story, Ginger. I've really enjoyed this. And thank you so much for uh, for coming and sitting down and talking with me. We will do this again. Yeah, I love your podcast. Uh, I love that it's candid. And I described it to somebody the other day. I'm like, he just doesn't care. Like, he's just a honey badger. He's just saying what he wants. <laughs> like, he, nobody's regulating him. <laughs> that's, that's why I put the explicit thing out there. <laughs> the chances of me dropping an F-bomb are pretty high. <laughs> that's what happens. I love listening to your show, uh, and I will continue to do so, and, and uh, hopefully we get to do this a lot more.